welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest living here in Austin, Texas, and uh, in my 49th year of recovery um, through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, a number of other 12-step fellowships that I've uh, uh, been a part of uh, along the way. The purpose of these podcasts is to try to help us go a little bit deeper into three things, the, the history of the program of AA, where it came from, how it originated, what it was like in those early pioneer days. Second thing is to um, look at the spirituality of the program. And, and again, try to do this from a, a deeper, more reflective uh, viewpoint, uh, not, not uh, maybe as simplistic as uh, uh, some, uh, some might, might wanna make it, uh, because I think it's very deep and it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, oh, what would I say? It's in, in the tradition of just about every faith tradition that uh, wants to bring about transformation in the individual. AA and the 12 steps have a marvelous way of uh, uh, capturing that and, and putting it in a process that people can identify with and follow. And then the third thing is uh, from a psychological perspective that uh, the work of Carl Jung, I think he, uh, he was very influential in the beginnings of the 12 step program. And I think uh, revisiting him and seeing what he was trying to uh, uh, induce in Roland Hazard, his, his patient, uh, who, who started the chain reaction that led to AA. Uh, I think if we can understand that, uh, we'll have a better grasp of what the program is about. So uh, I wanna thank you for, uh, for uh, coming back. And uh, what we're doing in this series is um, looking at a pamphlet. It's titled, uh, How to Listen to God. It's a uh, a very uh, important pamphlet in, in the history of AA. Uh, it was written by Chaplain John Batterson, and it circulated in Akron, Ohio, back in the late 1930s. Dr. Bob uh, knew Batterson. Uh, I think we can um, surmise that the, the pamphlet was pretty influential in uh, Akron, uh, Cleveland area. Uh, back, back in the in the late 30s. What I like about it, and it's one of the things that uh, introduced me to the Oxford group and uh, its importance in AA history and in my own life, um, what, what I liked about it was it's a simple um, compilation of some of the basic Oxford group ideas, principles, uh, and practices that uh, Wilson said formed the basis of steps two through 11. So we have that quotation from him that he learned the, the program through the Oxford group and, and steps two through 11, he extracted in a sense from the Oxford group. So, so kind of uh, tuning into these is a really helpful way of understanding what's at work uh, within the 12 step uh, process of transformation. In the first episode, uh, I had Wally P on. Uh, Wally was uh, or is an archivist from Tucson, Arizona, AA archivist, and he's probably done more to popularize this pamphlet than uh, anybody else. Uh, he uh, says he's distributed about one million copies. He's gone all over the country and really all over, all over the world. Um, talking about the pamphlet, telling how it changed his life and teaching people how to do this thing called two-way prayer. Um, he mentioned uh, in the last podcast, James Hauk. Uh, James was an Oxford group guy who got sober the, the very day after Bill Wilson did back in 1934. But he stayed sober through the Oxford group. And it was when uh, Wally met him that he introduced him to some of the principles and practices. I got mine through another AA archivist uh, by the name of Earl uh, Husband in Oklahoma City about 30 years ago. Wally went on his journey, I, I went on mine. 
uh, but they've kind of come to the same place that uh, that we've missed something in 12-step uh, recovery world, and that that is the the pioneer program. And if we'll study that pioneer program, we will come away with a deeper understanding uh, of where AA came from. Some things were left behind, and I think that's a good thing, but uh, uh, some things were left behind and, and it's uh, to our detriment. And particularly that I think has to do with the pamphlet that we're gonna study and the whole process of two-way prayer. So we're gonna dive in deep. This is gonna be a deep dive. We're gonna go slowly through the pamphlet. I've never done this before. But it did come up in my in my guidance that it would be a good thing to do. So uh, here we are, and I'm doing it. Uh, the pamphlet uh, is in the show notes, so if you want to uh, grab a copy of that, uh, it'd be nice to follow along. But it's not uh, really necessary. So uh, let's let's start dig digging in. Um, start with the title. Kind of comes as a shock, did to me. Uh, the title of the pamphlet is how to listen to God. Well, in, in all of my training, um, I don't know that anybody ever sat me down and said, now, here you go, you're, you're going to listen to God. Uh, we can talk about God, we can read about God, but uh, the emphasis here is on listening, listening to God, hearing the voice of God, and that comes as a shock uh, to most people, uh, because it's not something that we really are familiar with. So uh, this is a how-to pamphlet. Uh, pay attention to that. This is a little mini instruction manual on how to go about this process. Uh, now, I took this manual, and I, and I read it, and I, I studied it, and I, and I uh, practiced from it. Uh, but then over time, I, I did make some tweaks and changes to it. Uh, I'll, I'll reference some of those as we go along. But this is this is the original. I want the original to speak for itself. I'll put a copy of my version uh, of it on the How to Listen to God, which is what I do in, in my two-way prayer uh, workshops. <coughs> so let me, let me start in with, with some reading. It starts off saying, these are a few simple suggestions for people who are willing to make an experiment. Start right there. This is an experiment. Uh, you can study this thing. You can analyze this thing. You ain't going to, you ain't going to know what this thing is talking about unless you enter into it in the spirit of an experiment. And I think that's also something that can be very helpful um, that the pioneers offer us, that the, really the whole 12 steps is, an, is meant to be an experiment. Uh, you're starting at one and you're heading to 12. And if you'll do two through 11, you're gonna come out of the laboratory with an experience, uh, not a you'll start with a theory, but you'll have the experience, and then you're going to come up with a, a fact for your life that is going to change you. Um, so, pioneers went through the steps relatively quickly so that they could get a taste of of what that transform transformed state really felt like and how it, uh, how it acted uh, in their lives. You can discover for yourself the most important and practical thing any human being can ever learn, how to be in touch with God. So in step 11, that, that's exactly what we talk about, isn't it? Uh, through prayer, and meditation, we, we experience conscious contact, a conscious connection, not vague, not floating out there, but a very realized experience of this inner reality. Says all that is needed 
is the willingness to try it honestly. Every person who has done this consistently and sincerely has found that it really works. So once again, um, you know, you, you can sit in chemistry class. I, I never did well in chemistry, but uh, you sit there and, and, and they teach you these things in, uh, in, in the lecture. But then every, every chemistry class also has, you know, a period of going into the laboratory where what you learned in the lecture now becomes a, a lived reality in the laboratory. And, and so that's what, uh, that's very helpful in approaching these steps. Don't look at them academically. Isn't this brilliant? No, it's not brilliant. It's, it's a how-to process of doing certain things to see if you're gonna wind up with a certain result. Approach it that way. And the steps uh, that for me took on a whole new life. And that was the 20 years sober. I had kind of been taught them as, as uh, you know, these holy sacred things or something, this mysterious process. Not so in the beginning, a very simple process uh, to take hold of them, uh, to do what they say, and then to ha have that experience that comes along with them. Uh, so to try it honestly. So that's the way to approach this, this document that, um, that uh, I'm gonna be willing to give it a try. I'm honestly going to enter into it. And then perhaps I will have this experience. Now I've done uh, two-way prayer workshops uh, not as much as, as Wally has done, uh, but I've, I've done dozens and dozens of them, may, maybe 50, 75, I don't know. Uh, and and, and when, I, when I teach people how to do this in a very simple manner, uh, at the end of the workshop, we, we have the laboratory and, and, and people begin to listen to the inner voice. And when they do, they are amazed, uh, often coming to tears, often finding, even with 15, 20 years sober, uh, finding that lived experience that was perhaps missing from their lives. Now, the pamphlet goes on. He says, before you begin, Look over these fundamental points. They are true. And again, are based on the experience of thousands of people. So now they're gonna list several, several points. There's, there's uh, uh, nine or 10 of them that they go through. I wanna tackle maybe one through five in this episode. Um, but again, based on experience. So, so we're going to lay them out and, and we'll kind of pull them apart. And then I want to kind of end with the Jungian take on what's being said here, because it'll, it'll put it in a, in a slightly different framework that I hope will be helpful for you. So first five points that Batterson makes in his little pamphlet. He says this, and this, again, this is what people experienced. They experienced that God is alive. He always has been, and he always will be. Now, first thing you got to do is start getting over this he business, you know. Uh, in many 12-step uh, meetings that, that I attend, uh, there's been a change. Uh, the, the he reference is, uh, is being replaced by the God word. Uh, God is no more a he than a she. And it's one of, the, one of the fundamental difficulties of the English language. Um, that God's not quite an it, that there's this personality element to God, that God is a person in some way, uh, 
not 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 in a in a human kind of way, but that's all we got. All we can do is take the very best image we can come up with, and that is that God is in relationship to us, and, and God is more than a thing. So uh, the language the language gets gets. Uh, to bog you down a little bit here. So I'll change it. I'm going to change it as, as we go through it. And, and where it says he, I'm, I'm just going to say God. Um, so God is alive. God always has been. And God always will be. So this, this great reality um, is real. Second, God knows everything. Now, what's this saying? That there is a source of knowledge beyond ourselves that, that has the answers that we need if we can be put in living contact with it. You know, uh, when we come into the program, we are lost uh, and we're in search of a way out. I, I always like that when they were again searching for a name for Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the names they wanted to choose was for the title of the big book, A Way Out. But when they researched it, there were like 15 or 20 uh, titles already using that name. So they went in search of another, but, but that's what it is, isn't it? Uh, we are lost, uh, we are dying, we are uh, up against something bigger than ourselves, addiction. And we're seeking a way out. Well, that's what this number two point is about. Not God knows everything like some wise old man in the sky. No, that there's a source of wisdom. That if we will connect with this source of wisdom within ourselves, it will lead us out. It will lead us out. Number three, God can do anything. Well, we say in the program, what this is a miracle program. And that's usually what it's going to take for most of us. It's going to take a miracle. It's going to take our shifting from an ego perspective that the ego is the center and the source of all knowledge to a different perspective, that there is another source of knowledge, another source of transformation, a transcendent source. <clears throat> and if I will get in touch with that, then that is what will lead me out of the morass, out of the, the, the death spiral that I find myself in. So very important to keep in mind when we're sitting there stuck in one, drowning in step one, that there is the step 12. <laughs> you know, then that's the goal. You know, there is a life raft. Uh, they, they use that uh, image in, in the book, don't they? You know, we were like passengers on a liner that went down. And now we've, we've been plucked from the sea. And now we're going to tell you how it was we got plucked. <laughs> Who plucked us, you know, uh, how that came about. That's what we want to share in this book. And, and, and don't be hung up on, uh, on your religious bias that's going to keep you, because it kept many of us from honestly entering into this experiment has the power God could and would if, if God were sought, the book says. Number four, God can be everywhere all at the same time. These are the important differences between God and us human beings. So, and this is calling for an open-mindedness that, that, listen, little ego, you're not the fountain and the source of all wisdom and knowledge, all right? You have run up against something 
where you are in need of divine assistance. But here's the good news. Many of us have found that that divine assistance is there and it ain't too hard to get in touch with. God is invisible, number five. We can't see God or touch God, but God is here. He is with you now. He is beside you. He surrounds you. He fills the room or the whole place where you are now. He is in you now. He is in your heart. Again, the focus is on experience. If I want to get out a microscope or, or uh, an x-ray and look at my heart in search of God, it ain't going to work. You know, God is everywhere in my heart, in my liver, in my mind, in my eyes, in my world. The only original thought, I've said this a few times, but I'm quite proud of it, you know, is this, this expression. You cannot be where God is not, but you can think you are. Well, if anything sums up my, my experience of this reality of God and the reality of the ego, it's that expression, that one sentence. I can't be where God is not but I can think I am. And when I think I am, then I'm the master of my ship. I'm the, I'm the one in charge. The ego has taken on more than it should. And the result is going to be chaos of some sort because it is incapable of doing that. What it is quite capable of doing is being in right relationship with it. And so everything, everything comes down to this getting the relationship right with this higher power that we call God, that we do not understand, but that we can experience and have an ongoing relationship with. And we can even begin to listen to in my life. That's what this pamphlet is beginning to introduce us to. So I want to I want to switch to um, something that um, I came across. I've read it before, but uh, I'm always looking for a nice, um, concise, relatively concise explanation from a Jungian perspective that that takes these basic concepts that the program deals with and puts them into another language. <clears throat> so I came across this recently in a book titled Carl Jung and Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, I'll put it in the show notes. It's written by uh, a Jungian analyst, an Irishman um, named Ian McCabe. Uh, I'd like to do a series with Ian one of these days. If you're listening, Ian, give me a call. Uh, here, here's what, uh, what he's from a Jungian perspective, the third step introduces a person to their true self. Now, their true self is where this ego and this divine self meet. And it's peaceful. You know, it's the serenity that we're each searching for. So from a Jungian perspective, it's the third step that introduces a person to their true self, paying heed to our true self allows us to become the person we were born to be, to develop our potential to the maximum. Um, so in step three, uh, um, I'm not just surrendering my life and will to God, I'm beginning to align my life and my will with God. 
I'm, I'm beginning the process of opening myself to this divine reality that is both within and without. And I'm going to need to bring my ego along with me on this journey. It's not the annihilation of the ego. It's the right relationship of the ego to the divine. All right. The third step, he says, is another incremental step in helping the ego to submit itself to the true self, to get that relationship right, to be right-sized. This involves acknowledging that the power of the self, capital S, is greater than the ego. He is the director, we are the actors, you know, uh, that, that's what that's all about. Get that relationship right. You know, he is the father, we are the children. Use whatever analogy you want, whatever metaphor works for you. But it's all about getting your ego right-sized. The ego only has to submit to be weakened as opposed to be annihilated. It isn't the destruction of the ego. I'll say this over and over again because I hear it all the time in 12-step. You know, it's like we got to get rid of our ego. You can't. You'll go psychotic. You know, you just, <laughs> you just have to grow up and you have to be rightly related to the greater power that is within you and that is greater than the little you. It's the great you that lives inside of you. Some good news here, guys. The ego will continue to function and remain as, quote, the center of consciousness. But we'll understand it is no longer the master and will begin to act more in the service of the self. Dr. Bob put his finger right on it. He said, what's this program about? It's about love and service. And, and in the next episode, we're really going to dig into the love uh, because we got to find something that feels better than alcohol or drugs or we ain't going to give them up. And what feels better is experiencing the love that is God and being of service to our fellow man, which gives meaning and purpose to our lives. He then quotes John Sanford. And Sanford was a Jungian analyst and Episcopal priest. And, and Sa Sanford offers uh, this understanding of the relationship. Sanford says, in Jungian psychology, there are two centers of the personality. The ego is the center of consciousness, whereas the self, capital S, the God within, is the center of the total personality, while the ego is a self-contained little center of the circle contained within the whole, the self, capital S, can be understood as the greater circle. So there is, there is this ego, this self, and it is small s, and it is the center of human consciousness. But it is contained within a greater self. And that greater self some of us would call God. Some of us, the big book will call it the great reality that is within. And everything depends on being rightly related from this little circle to the greater circle. If the little circle thinks it is the greater circle, which is delusional, all right? But that's our human condition, you know? We, we take on divine attributes and think think uh, this is who we are you know uh, well you've got a lesson uh, to learn so he goes on this, this is mccabe again jung considered <clears throat> that the ego was very necessary to help us function in our external lives it's as though when born 
the person is a whole self, capital S. And then the self, capital S, allows an ego to develop on the understanding that it is an emissary in the service of the self. Well, isn't this exactly what happens? Uh, we are born uh, in, a, in a state of divinity, uh, uh, connected with this inner self, this capital S. You look at the baby's eyes and what do you see? You see innocence. It has turned itself life and will over, uh, and, and not consciously, but unconsciously. It lives within that, within that right relationship, you know? And, 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 and what, what uh, uh, McCabe is saying here is it, it's, it's as if this God um, allow, not only allows us, but demands of us that we become a separate self, that we develop an ego, all right? But we do it within the structure and the right relationship with the divine and nobody does it nobody does it right uh that, 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 that that's why inherently we feel oh there's something wrong with me i got a hole in my heart well what's that hole that hole is the longing the longing for the connection that i feel should be there but is not all right so so that that's kind of the setup However, by the age of 40, when the ego has fulfilled many of its functions in relation to forging a career and maybe procreating, a sense of mortality enters a person's consciousness. So Jung says, in the first half of life, you build up an ego. And then in the second half of life, the rules change and you must begin letting go of that ego. Now here's the rub for alcoholics and addicts. It doesn't have a damn thing to do with whether you're 40 years old or not. It has everything to do with when you hit bottom and when you are ready to learn might come at 30 might come at 60 might come at 15. All right. But it comes and, and what, what Jung is saying about the second half of life rules are also the life rules that every addict needs to come in contact with, to understand and to live by if he or she wants to have peace, All right? This is the experiment. The question is asked, what is life about? Yeah, this, this is the midlife crisis. What is life about? It is here the self comes forward and answers that question. The person has a new purpose in the second half of life. It is to allow the emergence of the true self to act as the guiding force in their lives. To to come forward willingly in step three, and now to allow this God within to manifest in my life, to be realized through me, through you, that becomes your meaning and purpose. However, <clears throat> Oh, here comes the however. <laughs> the ego feels powerful and does not want the humble self to be the main personality. Ego does not want to take a second position to the true self. Indeed, in some instances, the ego would rather die then do so. Whoa, there, there, there's a hell of a statement. That there's a, 
uh, a conflict going on inside every single alcoholic and addict, all right? And, and, and it's not limited to us. It's not limited that, 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 that we're so out of whack. I don't think we're any more out of whack perhaps than, than many people who are not alcoholics and addicts. The difference is we had better learn this, this inner geography of the soul if we're going to live because it can kill us. And that was my, <laughs> my first sponsor says, Bill, you know, we've got a great advantage over the earth people. It's like we have this anvil hanging over our heads. And, and that anvil is there to say, you will realize uh, the truth of this, uh, this reality, this great reality within, and you will properly align yourself with it, or boom, it's going to come down on you. All right? And it does. It comes down on us. It may not mean that we drink or drug, but it will mean that we will be miserable. It will mean that we will go in search of another addiction to, 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 to take its place. All right? All right? It will be painful. Oh, that pain, if we will realize it, is a wake-up call that we've done it wrong, that we need to get ourselves back on track. So this relationship is critical and it needs to be watched, not just daily, but moment to moment, all right? Am I in right relationship with the powers within? Uh, is, is the great reality in charge of my life? Or has ego usurped, once again, God-like dimensions? He closes this section with this. He says, with alcoholics, the aggrandizement, the enlarging, takes the form of excessive drinking as though to suppress the spirit of the self. Uh, I believe alcoholics and addicts are... are mystics, we're misplaced mystics, longing for this right relationship, but substituting a false spirit for it. And here's where he quotes Jung. Hence Jung's axiom, and this is a quote in the letter that Jung sends back to Bill Wilson when Wilson wrote to him, uh, expressing his gratitude for his influence in the beginnings of AA. And, and, and listen to, and, and you know, when I read this from McCabe, I got a different perspective on it. I uh, read it a hundred times. I got it wrong, I think, uh, at least from the perspective that he's using it. So he, he says this, hence Jung's axiom, spiritus contra spiritum translates as one spirit, alcohol, contradicts the spirit, capital S. Perhaps it works both ways. Uh, perhaps, you know, uh, Jung says in his letter, you know, spiritus contra spiritum, spirit against spirit. The word that we use for the holiest relationship is the same word that we used for alcohol, all right? It's getting at the same thing. I guess it works both ways. That, 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 that if I'm in touch with this spirit, it has the power to overcome the spirit of alcohol. And looked at it contrary. The spirit of alcohol puts us at war with the spirit of God. Now, this pamphlet uh, was not written. Uh, this How to Listen to God pamphlet was not written for alcoholics uh, or for addicts. It was written for uh, anybody, uh, anybody who wants to learn how to listen to God. I think the thing that, that we need to be most mindful of is this, that I can't sustain a program that is not alive, that is not 
bringing me into conscious contact with something that feels better than alcohol or drugs. Not much that I remember from my first uh, time in treatment, but there are three or four things that really got my attention. And one of them was this, that a guy pulled me aside and he said, Bill, if you don't find something that feels better than alcohol and drugs, you are going to return to them. I knew he was right. Well, love and service and listening to God's voice within do feel better than alcohol or drugs. That I think is the good news. So <clears throat> we're gonna we're gonna kind of dig into this pamphlet uh, a little by little. I don't know how long it's gonna take to get through it. I'm not gonna try to rush it. I think there's some really good, profound uh, information that is here for us. So uh, I hope this series uh, turns out to be helpful. Um, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure uh, uh, where it's all leading, but uh, uh, if, if, if we enter into the the experiment uh, with the right heart, uh, it'll take us where we need to go. So thank you for listening. Uh, if you haven't been to the Two-Way Prayer website, encourage you to do that. And uh, if these podcasts are helpful to you, please do me a favor and pass them on uh, to a friend. We, I know God's guidance for me has been, get this thing about two-way prayer out there to as many alcoholics and addicts as you can. And that's what I'm trying to do. So thanks for listening. God bless and keep coming back.